All right, recording is on. Facebook's going live. Make sure it's working. It's not. You're nice. live. Okay. Great. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if this is a scary title or not, but today's message is Burning Coals. You see the smaller title there, Conquer Evil with Good. So it might sound familiar to some of you if you've read your Bibles pretty thoroughly. Then, um, Oh, I need, there's actually a devotional, family devotional in the big pack underneath the key. So I want to start with that. I forgot I was going to do that. In the, uh, one of the front pouches there. Oh, front pouches, okay. Well, the same one where the binds are there. This one. This one? <laughs> yeah, you're all around it. Yes. Oh, there was pouch. There you go. This one? Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this may be familiar to, I know it's familiar to Lena. This is Josh McDowell's family devotions. Everybody see? So, I'm giving credit. I'm giving credit. And this is actually today, so I don't know if you used it today already. If you did, it's fine. Maybe you'll have more input for me then. So, Facts and Feeling is the title there. Facts and Feeling. Right and wrong are not determined by feelings. So it's got a little story here. You ready? Mom lifted her gaze from the newspaper to her daughter, who sat at the kitchen counter eating a bowl of Fruit Flakes cereal. Tara, she said, doesn't your friend Janet live on Morgan Street? Uh, she's not my friend anymore, Tara humbled. Mom repeated her question. Doesn't her family live on Morgan Street? Tara shrugged. Yeah, why? There was a fire on Morgan Street last night, Mom explained, laying paper down on the counter. Two families were burned out of their homes. Did anybody die? Tara asked. No, everybody got out of time, but one of the families was named Turner. That's Janet's family, Tara said. It's got to be. Mom shook her head sadly. We should find out what we can do to help. I'm sure we have some extra blankets and clothing and things they could use. The paper says the house was a total loss. Do we have to, Tara said. Mom looked at her daughter with confusion in her expression. What do you mean? Tara sighed. She said, Jen has been, Jen has been really cruel to me and my friends this year at school, and I just, I just don't feel like helping her, that's all. Mom nodded solemnly. I'm sorry to hear she's been cruel to you, she said. Her voice soft. I guess I can understand your feelings, but feelings don't determine what's right or wrong, Tara. God does. You mean even though she's been cruel to me and my friends all year, I still have to, like, be all loving to her? Only if you want to do the right thing, Mom answered. Whether I feel like it or not, Tara said flatly. Whether you like it or not, not answered. Because, like I said, feelings don't determine what's right or wrong. Yeah, I know, Tara interrupted. God does. She took a final bite of fruit flakes and stood. I guess I have some t-shirts and sweaters I can bag up for Janet. Mom took her daughter's cereal bowl and placed it in the sink. I knew you'd do the right thing, she said. Do you think it was easy for Tara to decide to help Janet's family? You think it was easy? Yeah. Why? Why or why not? Why do you think it was easier? or Why do you think it was not easy for Tara to help Janet? I think not easy because they used to be friends and then she was cruel to her, so it was like, her friend turned her back on her, so she wanted to turn her back on her friend. So when people are cruel to you, it's harder to be nice to them, mm -hmm. you're saying. Yeah. So that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, but it, you don't think it's harder. 
Determines right and wrong. God, the Torah, God gave the Torah. The Bible, Kathy sold the Bible. Bible. Do your feelings sometimes make it harder to choose right? Mm -hmm. Should you choose right anyway, even when it's hard? Yes. Okay, you all get high grades today. Very good. Very good. So let's pray. Our feelings sometimes lead us to take the easy way out when it comes to showing love to people we don't like. Give us strength, Lord, to do what's right anyway. Hashem Yeshua. So, we see facts versus feelings and those important questions. Now let's move on. There's a scripture here. It says, never seek, I think I'm going to add these out of order. Oh, I think I added something later. That's what happened. Vengeance and payback are mine for the time before the time when their foot slips. Okay, so this is Adonai speaking. Vengeance and payback are mine. They belong to him for, for the time when their foot slips. So there's a, there's a time plan. If you stay in rebellion against God, there's a time plan. He knows when you're going to be slipping. And, and there's a plan for that. So you don't want to stay in rebellion because you don't know what that time is. For the day of their calamity is coming soon. In context, it was it was talking about Israel, but it, there's there's this sort of thing. Jo Jonathan Edwards used this in his famous sermon, by the way, his most famous sermon. Their doom is rushing upon them. Their doom is rushing upon them. So remember, vengeance and payback belong to God. And then we come to this verse. This is from Shaul, uh, all right, in Romans 12, 19 to 21. It says, never seek revenge, my friends. Doesn't that go with what we just saw from the Torah? Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, leave that to God's anger. For... Now, by now we should all be very good with this qualifying word for, for or because. So it's telling us why here, why we should not, or why you should do something and why you should not do something is qualified by a phrase that's prefaced by for. Why are we not to seek revenge? For or because in the Tanakh it is written. So from that statement, I was going to go into it later. But just from that statement, from that little phrase, can you see that Shaul's, Shaul's understanding of the Tanakh, Shaul's understanding of the Torah, because that's where we saw part of his quote comes from, that the Tanakh, the Torah, are still important to Shaul. Mm -hmm. He hasn't thrown them away. He says, for in the Tanakh it is written, Adonai says, vengeance is my responsibility. I will pay. This is a paraphrase of what we, what we just read. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Take care of your enemy's needs. Take care of your enemy's needs. For by doing this, you will heap fiery coals, and, and, and uh, the CJB adds this of shame. You will heap fiery coals on his head, is what the text says. When they're adding of shame, it's uh, adding, you're adding to the text uh, in order to help, in this case, in order to help people understand. What's this 
putting coals on their head. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. That doesn't seem to match the rest of the verse. What's that all about, right? So they're trying to explain that this is coals of shame, that it's a metaphorical thing. Do not be conquered by evil. When people do bad things to you, don't turn and do the same in return. We're not guided by feelings. Feelings don't determine what's right and wrong. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good, even taking care of your enemy's needs. Oh, not quite yet. Um, who wrote this again? Shaul or Paul or Paulos. Is this, is this based on the principle of justice or on the principle of mercy? One, you agree? Mercy, couple mercy. Okay. With that in mind, on what basis did he tell his audience not to seek revenge? What's his foundation? Where is this principle coming from? Torah. Well, the one verse about not taking vengeance was from the Torah. Does anybody know where this, this last part about feeding your enemies, where did this come from? It did. He does tell us. It's going to say from the Besora. From Yeshua. <laughs> it sounds like something you would find in the Besora or the Besorot, which is the Gospels. But he tells us here, you see up near the top, remember the word for. For in the Tanakh it is written. So there are two quotes there. One is from Torah, but both are from the Tanakh. We'll find out more specifically in the Tanakh in a minute, but I want you to see the basis of Shaul's statement, which is a statement uh, using a principle of mercy, is coming from the Tanakh. Are you with me? Because some people seem to like to suggest that one side of the Bible is all about justice, or and there's like the mean God there. And the other side is all about love and mercy. And that's a different God there. He's a nice God. We want this one. We like this guy. We don't like the other guy. But that's not, how many of you know that that's not an accurate picture of the Bible, first of all? How many of you know that grace is on both sides? How many of you know that justice is on both sides? Mm -hmm. How many of you know that judgment is on both sides? Good. Based on the text, are those the words of a man who was against following the commands of God in the Tanakh? No. no. These are very simple questions, aren't they? But you have to take your time and really read what the text says and not skim over it quickly. But it's very clear in the text, isn't it? What's the methodology what is this methodology about? What is this feeding your enemies? Where did that come from? We said it's the Tanakh. Let's find out specifically. Unless anybody knows. Does anybody know where this passage comes from? Where this quote came from in the Tanakh? Do I say that? If you don't know, it's okay. Proverbs, you're right. Yes, the Mishlei. Um, and we're going to see it now. If anyone who hates you is hungry, this is, the other text said your enemy, right? Your enemy. If anyone who hates you is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Before you will heap fiery coals, and again, see it's added of shame, on his head. You will heap fiery coals on his head. And notice this ending is different. And Adonai will reward you. Adonai will reward you. What do you think about that? What is that, first of all? How would you describe that? That statement, Adonai will reward you. 
I said, a mere possibility. It's a promise. It's a promise, a guarantee. For this behavior, Adonai will reward you. That's important. What kind of reward might you expect if you do this? Is that a little, is that a little difficult to even, to even envision? I don't know. If you go around feeding and giving water to your enemies who hate you, how do you envision that they will react? You might get to heaven sooner than they <laughs> think. <laughs> you might get to heaven a little sooner, someone said. Than they think. Yeah, that's the sort of thing we envision. Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. 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 Solomon, Shalomo, yes. What is significant about Shalomo? What is he known for? He was a wise man. Wisdom. Wisdom, very wise man, yes. Is this wise? Does this seem wise? We just, does it seem wise? And yes. is it wise? We just said, maybe it doesn't seem too wise. We might get in trouble. But is it wise? Absolutely. What is this phrase, heap burning coals on his head? Is this literal or is this figurative? Figurative. figurative. See, see, it becomes difficult for some people we like to take everything literally and you run into this. So feed them, give them water, and then put burning coals on their head. No. No. Now, this is figurative. What does it mean, though? What does it mean to put fiery coals on their head? Hmm. Well, there's that word for. Because by doing this, you will heap fiery coals on, on his head. Do you see? The way you're putting fiery coals on their head is by doing this. But still, what does that mean? How is that like putting burning, fiery coals on their head? Yeah, those, that's where those complete Jewish Bible adding in of shame is it, kind of important. That's what their understanding is. They said it's probably got to do with shame. Probably got to do with shame. Over your head, it would be quite a shock. It would right? be shocking. So yeah. If you do this to your enemy, they will be shocked. They yeah. won't expect it. Yeah. So maybe that's. Yeah. There's, so there's a shock factor. That's that's a very important too. Now after the shock, when the shock starts to wear off, right? Like after a few seconds, I mean the shock's going to slowly wear off, and as it's as it's happening then they're probably also going to be feeling some shame, like, I hate this person, and they're doing this. What kind of person am I? I hope it's difficult these days. Some people just don't seem like they're very introspective, though, but that doesn't mean they're not. And maybe the shock will make them more introspective. Mm. You know, we have a society that's very divided. There's a lot of demonization out there of people on other sides. That's very unfair. And, and unfitting. And it's not really proper for us to be too involved in. Let me give you a little bit of background on this burning coals. There's a... a Instruction of Amenemope, uh, an ancient Middle Eastern text. And in there it says, these are other texts, other ancient texts, right? And this one says, to feed your enemies until they are ashamed. It's actually, in, in, if you want to know, it's a little more than that. It says, save them, pull them out of the water from, you know, get them out of danger. Save their life, basically, and then give them your bread to eat. Give them so much bread that they get so stuffed full of bread that they become ashamed. That's more like the full, I'm paraphrasing, but that's more like the full quote. 
There's a Babylonian, there's Babylonian wisdom literature. And in there it says, don't return evil to one who disputes with you. Rather, smile on your adversary or give them favor. Do you agree that this would make the offender feel ashamed? Mm -hmm. I got a couple mild of those. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about it if you haven't answered. Because it's important. It's important because we're being told to do this. We're being told to act this way by the scripture on both sides, correct? If you want to divide it into sides, it's on both sides. We've seen it in Romans. We've seen it in Proverbs. We've seen that Shaul considers it authoritative, as he does the Torah. An Egyptian ritual in the third century BC, there was a ritual, third century, 200s, 200 and something before Messiah came in Egypt. There was this ritual. Offenders, when they went to ask for forgiveness, like you found out, uh, you had had an argument with someone, and you f found out somehow that you were the one that was wrong, right? And you want to go and ask forgiveness, right? There was a ritual, and it would make it uh, more emphatic if you did this, because it showed publicly, you're willing to publicly acknowledge, I was wrong. Do you know what? You know what the thing was? They would take a, a pan of burning charcoal and walk to the, uh, to the person they offended with this pan of burning charcoal on their head. They were hot <laughs> They were hot <laughs> Well, that, that's very good. That may have a lot to do with where our saying came from. They were acknowledging that they had been hot heads. That's, that's good. <laughs> There are other possibilities presented in the IBP Bible background commentary of the New Testament, and those are uh, that you would cause them emotional misery by your kindness. And, that, and there's another one, that they will be punished all the more severely in the day of judgment. What do you think about those? What do you think about that? You would cause them more mental anguish, more misery by being kind to them. And what about the final judgment? I think that applies if they don't do teshuva, right? Mm -hmm. A part of our motivation should be showing kindness, being an example, being a light in the world by following God's ways, which include this instruction, in order to bring them shame so that, this is the important part, so that they will change. Or at least you're opening the door to a larger possibility that they might change. Fair enough? Now, does this methodology work? <laughs> does it work? Is it effective? Does it really bring reward? Does it really bring reward to do this? Yes. Jane's nodding yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She said, absolutely. Why? How do you know? Because it's easy enough. Because it's in the Tanakh. I can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. So that, God what he says. Lying. Can't argue with that one, but what, did you have something else in mind? Or? Oh, I can think of some times when I've experienced it. Some times when you've experienced? The one that, that stands out to me the most was a, she wasn't exactly an enemy, but at the moment, the moment I represented to her something that was just setting her off. I represented mm. someone who was causing her severe pain. Mm. And I walked into her home 
and she just started to rail at me and the Lord said be quiet don't say a word just put your arms out and she was angry she was gonna hurt me and she was about twice my size at that point she comes toward me and I just held my peace and held my arms out and she fell on me grabbed hold of me and started crying she just was just weeping and just my, my shoulder got wet she was crying so hard and when she could talk again she all this that pent up inside her this anger that she had just was gone and we had a talk and I could speak with her and she received a healing from the pain that was inside her but if I had met her if I had not met her with that that silence that openness that I'm gonna give you whatever you need I don't know what it is you guys like want to kill me she really did and but the Lord told, just said be quiet open your arms and that was in a sense it was he being burning coals on her head it would have been if she had wanted to come at me she had no she had to think twice about coming at me and really hurting me you didn't let your feelings no. dictate to you what was the right thing to do i didn't want to do what he said to do but i did it because he said to do it quiet open your arms Okay, so has this been tried? Do we have an example for this in the Tanakh? Can you think of an episode in the Tanakh where this was actually tried? Okay. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. I'll give you a minute to turn there. Starting in verse 18. At this point, Israel, the, north, the, the kingdom was divided. The northern kingdom was called Israel, the southern Yehuda. And the northern kingdom of Israel had been experiencing raids by the people of Aram. And it's, Aram was uh, also in the northern area to the east of Israel, north and east. It says here in 2 Kings 6, 18, and we'll read through 23, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to Adonai. So this army is coming, and they're, they're first they're running into the prophet, Elisha. Okay? And they see, they see Elisha, this was going against him. This is the same episode, I believe, by the way, where he's alone, the prophet, with one servant. And the servant's like, what are we going to do? The, they're all around us, this whole huge army, and there's just the two of us. What are we going to do? And uh, it's the episode where uh, Elisha prayed, God, open his eyes so he can see. And there's really the huge army, right? And so after that part, Elisha prayed to Adonai, please strike these people blind. And Adonai struck them blind, as Elisha had asked. Next, Elisha told them, you've lost your way, and this isn't even the right city. Follow me, and I'll take you to the men you're looking for. Then he led them to Shomron. Shomron is Hebrew is Samaria, the capital city of, of the north. On their arrival in Shomron, Elisha said, Adonai, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Adonai opened their eyes, and they saw. There they were in the middle of Shomron. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, my father. Notice, he's calling his spiritual guide his father. He said, Elisha, to Elisha, he said, my father, should I attack them? Should I attack them? He says it twice. He's very excited. <laughs> right? You repeat things when you're very excited. Should I attack them? Should I attack them? He answered, don't attack them. Exclamation point. He was very adamant. Don't attack them. You wouldn't even attack prisoners you had captured with your own sword and bow, would you? These are prisoners. So give them food. 
to eat and water to drink, and let them return to their master. So he provided well for them. He didn't just give them food and drink, he provided well for them. And after they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they returned to their master, their king, in Aram. And after that, this is important at the end, after that, remember there's a promise of a reward. Remember that? In Proverbs, after that, no more raiding parties entered the land of Israel from Aram. Why do you suppose that was? How do you think they felt? <laughs> Their eyes opened and suddenly they're in Shobrov and they're prisoners. How do you think they felt when they were prisoners and they heard the king saying, should I kill them, should I kill them? And then the prophet grants them mercy. Not just mercy that they'll live, but they're fed and they're given water to drink by their enemies and then they just let them go. People that they hated and had come to kill had conquered them, fed them, and let them go. How do you think they felt? Keith, you were in the military. How would you have felt? Horrible. Horrible. Bill, you were in the military. What, what do you think? I mean, I'm pretty sure you were never captured, but how do you think you would feel if you were captured? Pretty bad, right? And how would you feel if it's someone you're going to attack, you're going to kill them, but they capture you, and then they take care of you and let you go? That doesn't happen too often. That doesn't happen too often. I mean, obviously, there will always be other other circumstances to take into account, uh, but all other things aside, war is hell. All other things aside, you feel you feel shame. Like I came to, to hurt these people, and and they're helping me and letting me go. Does this mean that Israel did not have enemies? Of course not. Did it, did it mean that they should never fight any wars? Should it should we like? Should there be no wars ever, like when people are, are attacking, coming against, like the army of Aram was coming to attack them. So does this principle, is, is this saying you shouldn't defend yourselves in a war then? Is that what it's saying? No. no. Did it mean that they should treat people, even enemies, who were within their power decently? Did it mean that they should treat people, even enemies, who were within their power decently. Yeah. Yes. Did you know that before any Israeli air raid into Gaza, there are flyers dropped? There's a pre-air raid air raid where flyers are dropped notifying the civilians where the attack's going to happen and, and telling them, please stay out of that area so that you don't get hurt. And you know those air raids are always responses to attacks from Gaza. Drop leaflets first. Tell them, this is where we're going to strike. Please go away from here so you won't get hurt. Who else does this? It was done in World War II. America does it. Why do we feed prisoners of war? And why do we release them when the war is over? Geneva, Geneva Conventions. <laughs> but what are those rules based on? What are those, where did those ideas come from? <laughs> What's the basis for that kind of treatment? Love your neighbor. What do you think? Think about the ancient world. How often did things like that happen? We read this story, it's kind of an anomaly, right? What's the most common thing that you think probably happened in the ancient world? Either slaughter them all or turn them into slaves. Yeah? Certainly not this. The basis for this kind of treatment is coming from the Tanakh. Well, now let's talk about application, because that's important too, right? 
-hmm. How can you apply this principle in your life today? Do you have to be in the military? No. no. Jane already told us we don't have to be in the military. Have you ever been in a conversation where you were civil, where you were civil, and the other person was not? How did that go? How did that go? Were you able to maintain your composure throughout? Was it easy? If you did, was it easy? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been at least calm enough to ask the other person to try to be more civil? How did that go? How were, were you ever in a, in a conversation where the other person was civil? Maybe you were not. Have you ever been asked by anyone, this might be a clue, because you know we're always all right. <laughs> this might be a clue. Have you ever been in, in a conversation where, where the other person asked you to be more civil. It's called marriage. <laughs> does this principle, does this principle require compromising the truth. Is that what it's about? No. Is it about compromise? It's not about compromising the truth. Good. Can issues be discussed honestly and in a civil manner? Yes. Is it possible to have both of those happen? An honest discussion and in a civil manner? Now, Feelings do matter, right? But facts matter as well. And remember, truth is not discerned by feelings, even though they matter. Are you with me? We can't let our feelings rule us. This is Shaul's discussion of, of uh, flesh and the spirit. Flesh is our feelings, letting our feelings rule and guide us. This is also the mantra for many years now in our society. Yes. If it feels good, what? Do it. Do it. How can it be wrong if it what? Feels good. Feels so good. Are those true? Are those principles that we should live by? No. No. Uh, is it a true reflection of reality if it feels, how can it be wrong if it feels so right? Are there things that feel right that are wrong? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like vengeance, it's where we started, right? Feel so, remember a long time ago, uh, what were they, uh, Charles Bronson, like Death Wish movies. Mm -hmm. Right, the vigilante, very popular around the country in different time periods. Clint Eastwood, I think, had a series of vigilante kind of movies too, right? Where people felt like it was, yeah, you watch it and say, yeah, that's what we should do. That, well, you know, do you feel lucky? I think what he's seen in the I probably should finish quickly before the power goes out. Got this dream on. So issues can be discussed both honestly and in a civil manner if both parties are willing to do that. The midrash on the midrash on Psalm 34:2 speaks of your enemy, your enemy as the Yetzer Hara. What is the Yetzer Hara? The, uh, the, 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 
the evil inclination. Your real enemy is your evil inclination. It's not the person sitting across from you. And the Midrash goes on to say that the way to overcome it is by responding to it with Torah, mm. which is spiritual food and drink. What do you think about that? Do you agree? Isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't that what Shaul was leaning towards? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what, what was the foundation of his presentation of doing this? The foundational principle of this command, what would it be? Not where is it from, but what's the foundational principle for this command? You remember the command we're talking about? Right? What do we do with our neighbors? Love. Love. Feed them and drink. Okay. Say it again. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You will. How many ways is this showing love to your neighbor? You're respecting them as a person, right? As a human being giving them dignity as an image, just like you are, an image of God. Both of you are armed, by the way. We all are, to different degrees. But we're all an image of God. We're all armed. Giving them respect. And also giving them mercy, giving them a second chance or more than a second chance. Taking care of their needs. There are a number of ways that this is loving your neighbor as yourself. What about the other one? There are two primary commands, right, in Scripture. We said that the other week, right? There are 613 mitzvot. You know, there are like 2,000 in the Rish Hadashah, by the way, if you don't like 613. You know, whatever. Uh, and the U.S. Code of Law has many, many thousands of laws. You don't know what all of them are. That doesn't mean they're not there. Doesn't mean they're not there. So you're living by many right now and have no clue. All right? But we said that all of those 613 could be summarized in 10. Remember? And then we said, you know, those 10 could really be summarized in 2. And then we took it a step further. We could summarize those 2 in 1. And the 1 would be, do you remember the 1? That you love God. Love. Just love. Right? But we need, but we need like clarification. Love. We need to understand what love really is. Love. Right? And and so the two goes to love your neighbor as yourself. And what's the other one? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this is very detailed. All your resources all your spirit, all your mind, all the things you're, you think about. When you lie down, when you arise. Yeah. And how do we do those two things? Well, the 10 words explain it a little further. And the 613 explain it even better. And Yeshua came to what? To fill it full. Mm -hmm. To fill it full. So how, though, is this commandment loving, if you follow it, loving Adonai, your Elohim, following the Lord your God? How is it loving him to follow this commandment? To 
to give food and drink to your enemy. So you're showing mercy like he showed mercy to you. You're showing them mercy. Okay. So it would be pleasing to him because you're how many you, how many parents in the room? Parents? How do you feel when your children are growing up and you start to see them make good choices, like good moral choices, that they that you know they've seen you do? As an advocate, yeah. <laughs> oh no! Is it, that was, oh my goodness. I don't know if I want to ask, right? Is that because of you or because of them? Or, uh, where I want to go with that? You uh, probably shouldn't. But when you see, <laughs> but when you you feel proud, you feel happy, you feel you feel very good. You know that they're making right choices, that you've done well, that you've ex you must have explained things well or lived something out. You've done something right because you can see. And, and, it, and it also, now this isn't the case maybe for God, right? But it, it can ver validate for you uh, that what you were teaching them was right because you somehow you see it better in other people. Don't you see it better in other people? When someone else is doing something wrong, well, you know that's wrong, don't you? You might not notice so well if you're the one doing it. It's a little harder to see. But you see something else do someone else do something wrong. It's very clear. Same way with, with doing something right. A lot of times people who, who live righteous lives don't even realize what uh, an example they're being how much of a life they, they're being, because it's, it's kind of become second nature to them to live right, to do certain things right. They have exercised the truths that they know and made them such a part of their lives, they don't think about it anymore. But when they look at someone else, right, doing some beautiful, wonderful mitzvah, helping someone and showing love to their neighbor, it's still like gets them in here mm -hmm. and they know that it's right. I don't think God needs any reaffirmation from us about what's right, but I'll bet he feels good when he sees you doing right. I don't think he's guided by his feelings either. If he was, we would have been wiped out long ago. This is the term uh, he had that describes him called long suffering. And the reason he's so long suffering, because he loves us. He's willing to wait for us and give us every chance possible to turn from doing evil and do good. To turn from past, to turn from attitudes and mentalities that would say, strike back. That will say, vengeance, retribution, they belong to me. Don't mess with me, because I'll get you. Is that what he teaches us? No. no. Don't be guided by your feelings. Feelings can lead you astray. You know what's right. When you enter the new covenant, God is writing in your mind his Torah, his guide for living, his truths. And he's etching them into your very heart, giving you a passion to learn them more. But not just to learn them, to know what they are, but like the chief rabbi in the first century, Yaakov James, not just to know them, but to do that.
That's what this is all about, practical application. Amen. 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 And in our day, in our time, if you've ever been on social media, <laughs> then it's a great testing ground for you to try to apply this. If you haven't already. Maybe you have in the past and you're starting to struggle with it because certain arguments come up and, and people can be irrational this way or that way or both ways. And we struggle. How are we supposed to handle this? Are we supposed to handle this? How many arguments should we be involved in? Is that really always our place? But our guide should always be love. And a biblical, with a biblical understanding of love, which is explained to us by the Torah. Amen? Amen. Because all people are created in His image. And we as his followers reflect him we bear his image people look at you and hopefully they know that you're believers and they look at you for what that life is supposed to look like they look at you to get a better understanding of what God is like And that's a huge responsibility. How well do we handle that responsibility? How seriously do we take that responsibility? Just something to consider. And hopefully learn from be able to apply what you learn. You rise for the blessing. protect you, no matter what you're going through, or what you're facing. Adonai, make his face to shine on you, giving you his favor, and be gracious to you, giving you his mercy in all circumstances. Adonai, lift up his countenance upon you, not turn away from you in your need, but always be with you, watching over you, and give you his perfect, holistic peace, his shalom, Meshem Yeshua, in the name of the Messiah. Ben Elohim, the Son of God. Amen. 57 minutes and 20, <laughs> 29 seconds.